Okay, and I will, uh, well, how specific we get depends on what uh, uh, Greg wants to say, but Greg is, uh, it's Greg's responsibility, it's my responsibility for the purchase and for the operation up till Greg took over, but I think I'll let Greg answer that. And sure. Yeah, the, the, the uh, Warren touched on it and the comments from the, uh, as reflected there, are, are very accurate. If you look at uh, this quarter's results or our uh, last year's results, um, they were both, uh, they're disappointing as shareholders and disappointing in the uh, relative, relative to the other class one railroads. And as highlighted in the question, there's five other class one railroads. So it's pretty easy to um, um, understand how you're performing versus the others. And, it, and there's a lot of other variables, but there's some very um, simple things to look at. When we look at where we've been on uh, uh, with associated with Burlington, I would, I would just back up a little bit. Um, because if you go back to uh, 2021, the Burlington team and management team and the group, we're making excellent progress on a lot of fronts when it comes to our uh, operating and both being efficient and effective in how we're operating the railroad. And I remember very specific comments from myself in 2022 where I commented that uh, that was the year there was all the supply chain issues, a lot going on on the West Coast ports. Our trains were backed up in a variety of places, <clears throat> and we called that a reset year. And I think we did need a reset year on the operational side. But as we moved into um, 23, the business cost level, cost structure, we didn't reset it to the underlying demand we were seeing. Uh, we anticipated more demand, and, the, or, and we did not reset our cost structure. And the team's working very hard as we speak to to um, both reset the cost structure and allocate the cost resources uh, where they need to be. Uh, and, and when you go through something like that, uh, what we've recognized as an organization, yes, the, the demand of the rail will, will drive a certain amount of the cost, but the, the reality is that the rail industry, if you go back many, many years, it's, it's, it's flat. There's not a lot of growth in the industry. There's opportunities to become more efficient and effective and our margins can go up, but the reality is the demand's going to be flat, but it does move within different sectors of the rail. It can be in the consumer products, it can be an industrial, it can be an egg, but overall it's generally going to be relatively flat. So we need to get our cost structure right, and we need to get it right both for the, the coming year but for the long term. And that means it's going to be a continuous exercise. We can't stop. We can't say we, we've gotten far enough because our competitors and we compete with the other rails, but we also do compete with the truck industry. We have to have a cost structure that allows us to compete both within our rail industry and within the transportation sector as a whole. So the team at Burlington is working very hard to address the cost structure, uh, just like we have in the past. I think one thing uh, we do recognize when the other railroads have implemented uh, precision scheduled railroading, there's other metrics that we have to continue to pay attention to and, and challenge ourselves. If we're not at their level, what are the things that are driving it? So we're going to, when they ask for specifics, I'll give you a few. Uh, we have to look at our rail yards and understand how we're, how we're managing that. We have to look at our locomotive fleet, both the size and how we're utilizing that and challenge ourselves. And we have to then go back to how we're using our employee resources and allocating them across the, the business. So there's a lot to be done there. Our team's 100% committed to uh, uh, driving to the right cost structure that's consistent with the underlying demand in the business. And, uh, and then we can't stop there is the, is the answer. So a lot to be done, but we have a, a team that's uh, absolutely engaged and committed to it and we'll make... Uh, we're going to uh, make good progress in, the, in, in this current year. At Berkshire, we want everybody to have the idea that there's a lot to be done with every business. You know, it, it, so, I mean, it is, uh, you know, 
we, the only Peaky would build a remarkable, remarkable company in Omaha, building company, really remarkable. And there's a question after everything they did, that something that was done particularly well, you know, digging a tunnel under the East River or something when it said it couldn't be done. Yeah. He would say he would be, he was pleased but not satisfied. <laughs> and that is exactly the way we want the attitude to be at Berkshire forever. Uh, Omaha is a railroad town. If, if President Lincoln in 1862, I think it was, had decided to pick St. Joe or Plattsmouth or any place else to build the Transcontinental Railroad, Omaha would probably be a little town of 20,000 or something on the banks of the Missouri. But, but making, with Lincoln's desire to make this the uh, eastern, eastern connection, uh, and make a transcontinental railroad, Omaha just took off. So it's been it's been ra- it's been railroading at, at its base. The, the uh, you know, and anybody that was interested in financial matters had to think about railroads. Uh, plus, they had a certain glamour to them anyway. But the interesting thing is that UP, which is our main competitor. Uh, themselves fell way behind 20 or 25 years ago before right. Jim yeah. before Jim Young came in and in 2000 whatever it was 8 or so I started buying three railroad stocks in North, and uh, Union Pacific BNSF and, and uh, Norfolk uh, Western I believe I, I don't know why I wasn't buying CNO but in any event uh, Jim Young had done a marvelous job with BN, with Union Pacific. Uh, so we, we were owned all three stocks. But what we did in 2009 is we were able, well, we already owned 22% of it, but overall it was $35 million, a billion dollars, which was a significant part of our capital, we were able to put it to work in a, in a business we liked. And we, there's certain tax advantages that come in terms of making money in something that's more than 80% owned, but call it 100% owned in this case, versus making it through stocks. So it has a, a net benefit to us from making the same amount of money owning one of the other railroads by owning all of the railroads, and we got $35 billion out during a recessionary period. I think that was the worst quarter, the third quarter of 2009, maybe the rails had had for a long time. So it's, it's worked out. Actually, it's worked out very well, but it's because we, we were putting out capital in 2008 and 9, and if we put, put money in anything, we'd have made a lot of money. But it's more satisfying, and it's actually better in certain ways, tax-wise, to make it from something that's 100% owned and a whole bunch, bunch of, uh, you know, 5% or 10% owned uh, uh, businesses. We're, you know, as I mentioned in the annual report, railroads are absolutely essential to the country. That doesn't mean they're on the cutting edge of everything. They're just essential to the country. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that's why the government, you know, I think they took them over one time and they, they, they negotiate what our labor settlements will be and everything. And, and if you shut down the railroads of the country, you'd, you'd, it, it would be incredible, the effects. Uh, but, and they would be impossible to construct now. I mean, it, uh, Look at what's happening in California when they're trying to build a line. I mean, you know, everybody's worried about the environmental effect of of every mile, and you know, and what will happen to the various species of birds. Can you imagine the rail system of the United States being built? <laughs> it, it, it would it would take decades unless the war was on and the government took over things and just ordered them. It, it can't create it. So we love owning. 
uh, a business like that, it's going to be around 100 years from now. won't be the best growth business in the world at all during that period, but it will be essential. And, and what it earns in its relation to its, pit, its, its, its replacement value is a pittance, but we'll do fine in terms of what we paid for it, and we'll, we'll distribute substantial amounts in relation to what we paid uh, to Berkshire in a very tax-efficient way. And uh, so it's, it's uh, when, when the question is, what are the issues relative to the other railroads? Uh, you know, it wouldn't have been the end of the world if, <laughs> at all if we bought the Union Pacific and Jim Young had stayed alive to run it for us. Uh, that would have been great too, but, but we had the opportunity to to buy BNSF, and it's been good for them, and it's been good for us, and we think it's been it's a very important asset to the country, and you know, I just hope we can find something in other industries that where it makes as much sense as that, where we can put a whole bunch of money to, to work uh, at an advantageous time. <laughs> uh.